Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where sales leaders teach you what's working for them and how you can build it yourself. This episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast is brought to you by our sales coaching and consulting services. Are you looking to create repeatable, scalable, and predictable revenue? We've helped thousands of companies grow their business with tailored expert advice backed by testing to ensure they establish the best practices that'll work for them. Head over to bit.ly forward slash predictable revenue coaching to learn more. Sales reps, there's a lot that goes into hitting your quota. It's not just about how much comes in the top of funnel. You need processes around your numbers, around your market, around your script, and around way, way more. Because if you don't, your conversion rate will definitely suffer. I'm your host, Sarah Hicks. And today on the Predictable Revenue Podcast, I'm going to be chatting to an expert about how to consistently hit quota. She is the co-founder and CEO of DemoDesk, the number one customer meeting platform for sales and success. DemoDesk empowers every rep to become a top performer by guiding sellers in real time, automating non-selling tasks, engaging customers in the meeting, and analyzing insights at scale. Before founding DemoDesk in 2018, she was a manager at Bain & Company, a consulted Fortune 500 companies on their sales and investment strategy, and managed multiple international teams. Veronica Riedela, welcome to the Predictable Revenue new podcast. Thank you so much. What a great introduction. Super happy to be here. I'm really, really excited to have you. Um, give us a little bit of context here before we dive into the into the process and the strategies. Um, who, who are we talking about? Who is this geared towards? Who are we helping consistently hit quota? Yeah, I mean, primarily, of course, to say jobs, right? So whether it's an SDR, whether it's an AE, I mean, anyone would love to consistently hit quota. <laughs> um, and even, of course, yes. Sir. So, I mean, we at Demodest, we build a tool that actually helps you um, uh, having the right things in place in order to have great customer conversations and ultimately hit quota. So we are thinking about this question basically all the time. And we also work with a lot of sales teams um, and do know what their processes are and also do know what works for them and what doesn't. So we have a lot of like different uh, proof points. And uh, this is also why I think it was a great topic for us to discuss, uh, to just share these experiences that we just collected over the work that we did with all these customers. And also, of course, about uh, uh, when we also built our own company, our own sales team. And uh, yeah, this is what I would love to share. Um, but I mean, of course, like happy to take the conversation to... Uh, anywhere where it makes sense, depending on what questions are that you would also have. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I can't wait. Um, I think, yeah, perfect context. That's a great place to start. Let's talk about from a sales rep's perspective, they are, you know, they're maybe in well enough into their sales career that they have a sense of kind of how it works. And now they're looking for that job where they, they know that they consistently can hit quota. Um, how do they prepare themselves? Like from day one, they're on the job. What can they start to do? Um, basically, yeah, to prepare themselves to consistently hit quota. Yes, I think the funny thing here is that it like actually starts before even joining a company, right? So I mean, there are certain types of industries, certain types of buyer personas that you as a seller can relate more to or can relate, can relate less to. Um, so for example, I mean, I can relate more to sales group, but maybe, I mean, less to people who are working in a legal department or less to people who are working in the tech department because I'm a seller myself. So, I mean, when you're selling a product that also sells to these personas that you can relate more to, I think that's a great sign, right? Um, mm-hmm. And also in terms of, uh, I mean, market size that you're operating in, you're choosing a new company or if you're choosing to join a new company uh, and sell a product, uh, I think you should also um, think about uh, market size, like how big is the market overall, how many comp- competition is there is, is out there, and also, I mean, how old is the company already? So there might be, I mean, a very huge, large company like Salesforce, and then, I mean, you might only get assigned a very small territory um, that has like already been worked a couple of times, and it might be a like, harder to hit quarter there because, I mean, uh, the reps that worked on this territory before you have already tried to gloss in a couple of times and maybe didn't work, maybe it did. I mean, I'm just giving an example, right? But I think there are more questions that um, uh, need to be asked, or you should ask yourself before you join a company, before you start selling a product. And uh, I mean, also just one very interesting fact that I actually read today, that someone shared on LinkedIn, um, 57% of reps don't hit quarter. So I think it's like actually quite a, quite a common theme uh, mm-hmm. that should in theory be like a question for anyone. Yeah. And um, yeah. 
Cool. So the first thing, right? I mean, first, sorry, just to summarize it up, but that's the first thing. And before, before actually starting to sell, like yeah. thinking about what's the right company for you to join, what's the right product for you to sell, and what's the right persona that you can also relate to. And then obviously, if join when joining a new company, I think it's also important how good management is there. So whether you can um, establish a great connection with the manager. And also, I mean, which stage the company's at also relates to obviously how big the territory and the market size already is. Mm -hmm. What do you think that a rep could ask, say they were, you know, interviewing for a company like Salesforce, where they know they are going to be assigned a tiny territory, potentially worked many times. Um, do you think there's still hope for somebody in that scenario to hit quota? Like what can they, what can they still like attempt to equip themselves with if they were, um, yeah, tasked with that kind of difficult job of having to sell into a, a territory like that? I mean, absolutely. Yes. I think there's like just not one right answer. I think there are also like even more questions that you could ask yourself before taking the sales job. Right. So especially questions around how transaction is to sell. Um, so, I mean, we also just, uh, constantly looking for sales jobs to join a company and our sales is like our sell, our sell is more transactional so very often I also speak with the, or in the past I mean, we feel that I'm out more properly now but in the past I also spoke with um, uh, sellers who worked at very big companies like Salesforce um, uh, um, uh, or um, what was the last company that I spoke with I mean Amazon it was right but I mean there are different types of products so if, if it's like a very expensive product and if you're typically selling to enterprise companies I mean, you would typically only sell like three to four days a year in order to hit quota. Mm -hmm. And that's like an entirely different sell. So, I mean, of course, I mean, if, you, uh, if you're working at Salesforce as a seller, it's a great product. I mean, we're using Salesforce ourselves. Um, uh, and then you're assigned a territory um, uh, that consists of, let's say, 20 enterprise customers. And someone has worked on them already for a few years. It might be that exactly in this year they close. And it might be that you are the perfect person because you can think about whom to strategically involve in the buying process in order to get to the decision in the end in order to push through the sell. Um, so it really depends also, I mean, on how, what you did before and how well you're positioned to succeed in the territory just because there was someone working on that before. It's not a reason why you shouldn't be able to do a better job. But if you only used to like doing the transactional sell or very entrepreneurial type of person and someone who re really finds a lot of energy like in closing every day, I think that's probably like not the right type mm -hmm. of job, right? Okay, absolutely. What about when you're on the job? So you found a company that you think aligns with your skill set. Do you think that you've got a good shot? What's the first thing that you should start to prepare yourself with now that you are in the company? Yeah, I think especially important for uh, a very good sellers. Also, what we see, I mean, the best sellers do their homework before they actually speak with the customer and the prospect. So um, at first, of course, knowing your numbers, right? So I mean, What's your quota? How much revenue do you need to bring in? Um, uh, what's the average customer value? So knowing the ACV and then understanding how many customers do you actually need to close? And what does it mean in terms of new logos? How long does the sales cycle typically, typically take? And then you can, I mean, just calculate backwards and understand, I mean, how many opportunities do you actually need to create and is it realistic? And if you have done that, I mean, the next step is, of course, also to research uh, your buyer persona, make sure you know the company, make, so, make sure you understand um, the industry, speak their language. And especially if you're selling with different industries, there might be like different words being used uh, in different contexts and like uh, understanding them in order to build trust with the customer then, which is probably like the second point that I would mention here, uh, which is extremely important. Um, uh, just like really puts you in a spot where you can able to, where you're able to connect with the customer faster. And um, yeah, just really like trying to understand how they think, what they want, what the goals are. And that's probably, I think, the first first thing that uh, that is essential. So doing your homework. Mm -hmm. I, I want to dig in a little bit on, on doing your homework in a sec, but I'm also curious to learn more about um, the knowing your numbers piece. So um, of course, most sales reps will have a clear target, whether that's like a dollar figure or amount of new, new logos that they're supposed to add. Um, but how... It, without the help of say like a rev ops or a sales enablement type um, function at the company, how would a sales rep go about doing that conversion backwards and like giving themselves realistic conversion rates to kind of figure out how many new opportunities they should be creating for themselves? Yeah, I mean, this come, again comes back to, I mean, how big and established the company already is. So for example, like in our own case, and we still a small company. Um, I mean, we like 50 people now, so we like not that small anymore. But of course, there, I mean, is not like a sales process that had been established five years ago and since then, I mean, hadn't been changed. 
which is a good and a bad thing. Um, so, I mean, just because um, you might not be hitting quota from the first month on, there might definitely be a way for you to find like your own way of establishing a sales process that works. So um, especially when knowing your numbers, uh, so coming back to your question, so we have sales reps that focus more on bigger deals and we have sales reps that focus more on smaller deals and both is fine. You just need to understand, I mean, if you do focus on bigger deals, I mean, that's just, I mean, uh, more work that needs to be done for these ones. It's just very difficult to do both. And uh, it's also a higher risk then, of course, especially for a startup, because if there's an established test process, it might not be working out in the end. And especially as a startup, we need to produce results quickly. And um, so again, like knowing your numbers, understanding how many customers you need to speak to in order to come close or actually also even overachieving a quarter um, mm -hmm. is incredibly important because otherwise your sales manager or some in that case will go to the sales team and say, hey, I mean, we don't have enough opportunities in the pipeline. I mean, it's not going to work. And then the sales team can say, yeah, I mean, it is because I'm only working on five opportunities, two of them close and they're big enough to hit my entire quarter, which might right. not be the same approach for someone else. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Um, okay. Now let's dig more into the, the, doing the homework, um, specifically around kind of industry or market, where is the best place for sales reps to go out and do that research? To, to do research behind like which industry and which market would be best for them individually or when they're actually kind of there once that they, once they have that job and they know their target their target market or their target segment, um, and they want to know that market or that territory really well, where where can they do that or how can they do that? I mean, there are a ton of tools out there, right? So I mean, first one, like obviously is LinkedIn, LinkedIn Sales Navigator. So we're also using that lot internally and like most of our customers are using it. Zoom Info is, is also probably like one of the top known tools. You can find a lot of information. You can even find buyer intent data. And so when you are working on a customer that might already have shown interest in your platform, typically Zoom Info has the possibility to show you whether they have been visiting your website or have been engaging with you before. And so that's data that you can get. And then I mean, also driving into your own CRM. So there might be, might have been more conversations before you actually started working that account with someone else. Maybe there's also information in your CRM from previous emails, previous sales reps, uh, previous marketing campaigns really trying to find information anywhere you can. And then, I mean, also what I typically find very helpful when speaking to people, especially um, over video, when you like don't have any connection to them is uh, stalking them on their private accounts or stalking them on Twitter or Facebook uh, and really understanding like, what kind of person they are. Um, so um, it doesn't only relate to the actual sales conversation, but to anything that you want. So for example, in my case, uh, um, some, um, at some point in time wanted an interview with a reporter and I really badly wanted this and he like, didn't reply and, but I didn't give up and, and um, I also found out on, on Twitter that he's a huge um, um, uh, baseball fan and I also found out which team he likes and then I mean uh, yeah just try to I mean um, address that within my email with, with my emails that I sent and then the end it actually worked because uh, he also then realized that I was really taking the time to I mean, find more about him than I was taking serious. And mm -hmm. uh, I was, I was taking it serious that I really wanted to speak with him. And uh, this also, again, comes back to building trust because whenever you don't know someone, um, which like typically is the case in sales, so typically just reaching out to people that you don't know. I mean, how should they, I mean, be able to trust you? And if you know something about them uh, that, that they can also relate you to, I think that's way easier for them to establish trust in the end. Cool. And what about um, kind of persona research or kind of understanding how to put yourself in the customer's shoes, learn about their specific problems that they might be facing or um, the kind of barriers that they have? Um, how do you go about that kind of granular research um, specifically around the solution that you're going to offer so that when you kind of finally get them on the call or you finally get a chance to write that email, um, you can be as relevant as possible? I mean, that's a tougher one, I think, like, as of today, I think it requires a bit more experience. And um, so that, what I especially love is um, the MBTI framework. We also use that uh, when uh, at Bain a lot. So I was working in Bain company before founding Demodesk and uh, uh, everyone had to take an MBTI test that assesses your personality. And um, there are different types of personalities. So um, uh, for example, there's um, uh, might be a buyer that is like very analytical. So they really want to see like facts and numbers. So when you speak to them and um, they care less about you connecting like on a personal level, which however, like is in, in like an very minimum level, always like important, right? But maybe for an analytical person, it's less important. Mm -hmm. You just want to see like facts, ROI, 
case studies, they want to see proof points of other customers, whereas there might be a, a, another MBTI tab with this, which is more the supporter. They really want you to, I mean, establish a connection, maybe speak about the weather for a bit longer than you would usually do. And they also want to understand that you are actually like helping them to achieve what they want in their company. So they're just like different types of personalities that need like different types of approaches, or at least like the chances that you succeed are higher if you know the personality. However, I mean, <laughs> in this case, you can't ask the customer to take a test before they meet with you, right? And there's a tool actually that also does that, that takes um, um, information from your social media profile. It's called Crystal. Oh. Um, it doesn't work 100% perfectly fine in all cases yet. So I think technology is not yet there. But um, when you are in a call with your customer, you, I mean, just from the first five minutes of your conversation, you typically understand whether the person is like more like, yeah, outgoing and more like supportive type of person, or whether the person is more like an introvert and they can more focus on numbers. So I think that's really something that you can feel and that you can adapt to. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, okay, let's talk about then the the first kind of meetings that you have. And this is a big part of, of course, what Demo Desk helps with. So this is really right in your area of expertise. How can a sales rep nail the discovery and the demo? Yeah, I think discovery is probably like the first uh, precondition to nail a demo in the second place, right? Or to, to nail a sell in the second place, because I mean, especially in B2B sales or B2B software sales, I mean, like the area that you're both working in, um, it, it's more about solving a problem for your customer or helping a customer achieve a certain goal. It's less about selling a product in exchange for money. And it, it's just not, it's just not that typically. Um, so discovery is extremely, extremely important. I also like had uh, um, another interesting statistics that uh, I just read once. And uh, I think when you conduct a demo without discovery, uh, you're 73% less often uh, in a winning uh, competitive opportunity. So it means you like a not positioned to win if you don't ask the right questions in the first place, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because you need to decide first whether there's an actual need for your product. I mean, if there is not a need, I mean, like there's also no chance to sell, like no one will really listen to you. Um, and then it's also super important to like ask very targeted questions. And I mean, all of us like, or like every more or less established B2B SaaS company typically should have like a list of questions that they typically ask in a discovery call. I mean, it should not be too intrusive. It should like be more of a conversation. Otherwise, the customer might be pissed. So it's kind of a tricky part. But really understanding what kind of pain points they're facing or what kind of goals they want to achieve. Also understanding, I mean, what motivates them personally is extremely important because then you also know what their decision criteria are because the person that you're selling to, I mean, in the end, it's also, it's, it's, it's a person. It's like, it's, it's not a company. And the person also might have a personal goal, a personal motivation. So maybe... I don't know, maybe they just need to um, buy more software um, in order to meet like the budgetary goals could be. Um, maybe they just really have like a burning issue because they, I mean, not meeting the revenue targets and they need a tool that helps them achieve that. Or maybe they just wanna, I mean, step up in their career and just like take the next position, become a team leader. And then they also need to show that they can be innovative and introduce new tools to the company. So they're like definitely different types of motivations. And that your seller, uh, that your buyer can have, and it's very important to to find that out, and they, that really helps you also then to like push the sell, uh, push the push the sell along, and uh, yeah, I mean also in the end, I think in discovery it's super important to convince them to get on a demo because it's like their time, it's super precious. I mean it's it's like it's a commitment from them to jump on another call with you and listen to like how you can solve, solve their problems uh, uh, and get, um, like, give you 30 minutes more of their time. Um, it's a huge commitment. So I think it's also a huge part of the discovery then to like convince them that it makes sense for them to schedule another call. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And how, how long does a, do you think a good discovery call should take? If some people are totally skipping that altogether and going straight for the demo, and we know that that doesn't work, or at least 76% of the time, it's, it's making it much harder. Um, how, how much time should a rep be taking with discovery before moving forward to, to attempting to sell or demo? I mean, I'd say at least 15 minutes, everything less than 15 minutes, especially in B2B software, it's just not realistic that you have really understood the problems that they're facing. Um, there might be certain situations where, I mean, they sent you an RFP which very with very specific evaluation criteria. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it's like very rarely the case that there are, I mean, like 10 software products that couldn't do exactly the same and like exactly like a clear list of criteria. And it's just based on facts. So typically it's just, I mean, you having to dig into 
your um, uh, your buyer's individual situation. Um, uh, and we also have the situation a lot when I mean our customers ask us to jump straight into the demo without like doing the discovery, because I mean they want to like save time. And what we typically do then is just I mean giving them a, like a mini mini demo, a mini overview of what the product can do. But then, I mean, like making it super short, like max five minutes and take the rest of the time, truly understand, I mean, how we can actually help them and how, what their problems currently are in the business and what they want to achieve. Yeah, I think that's that's a really common thing. And a lot of people come in being like, I, can you tell me pricing just like before we get into the demo or whatever, so that I know if this is even, you know, something that can fit into my budget. And then that can be a really tough uh sort of situation to handle for account executives or for closers, because like you say, they know that they need to discover what is going to be the selling point. Like what, what is critical to that um, customer? What are their priorities? And if they can find that out, then they can tailor this, their pitch, they can tailor their, their demo to that customer. And if they have to skip ahead, they don't have that ammunition. So um, yeah. How, how, what's your kind of recommendation on, on, even kind of convincing the the prospect or the customer of the value of the discovery that you kind of need to ask those questions. I think if if, if a customer is like very determined uh, in a sense that they like force you to do the demo right away. And I mean, again, I said, I think it's also like helpful. Uh, I mean, in, in that case, probably better to fulfill that request and just give them like a mini, mini overview mm -hmm. because telling a customer, no, I don't respect your request. I think that's also natural way to do it. I mean, in the end, I mean, they're coming because they want to buy. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think, I think giving a brief overview in that case makes sense. And I mean, then also explaining them that you first need to understand their problems because especially in, in, in the software world, I mean, software can do quite a lot. And uh, if you're just showing them all the different features without the actual context, I mean, the likelihood that they actually remember the things they should remember after the call, I think like close to zero, because if you're just going through a washing list, um, uh, the likelihood that they after the call can actually understand like, how the product is going to solve your problems is like, again, I mean, close to zero. So I think for like a normal average person, it should be like clear and explainable. Okay, absolutely. Um, okay, and how can a, a closer best kind of tailor their pitch then to their customers? Once they've gathered this information through discovery, um, how do they choose what to actually share of their product or their services? Yeah, I mean, first, I think, again, it's, it's super important to not jump into the product right in the beginning. I mean, unless your customer really like, wants you to do so, like, Briefly do so, and then make a detour, because then again, there's a high risk that your prospect just tunes out. And so you first need to, I mean, understand the context. That's why discovery is so important. And then like make a story for them that can actually relate to them. So you first need to like put yourself in a position where they can like trust you, so where they trust you that you understand the business. And what's actually most powerful is that when in the beginning of a demo. Um, uh, when you have done a proper discovery, just summarizing how you understand the business. So what we also typically have is just a slide um, uh, where we write down all the things that we have understood from the discovery call and we, how we have understood the individual challenges and then like showing it to them, going over it for a second and then asking them whether that is the correct view or whether there's anything to add or anything to correct. And then like either they tell you what they really need and really want, which is good, or they say, yes, I mean, you're 100% right. That's what I said. I agree. And then you have like their full buy-in mm -hmm. and the full attention for the rest of the demo. Uh, so I think that's a very powerful tool to really like write it out on a slide to make it like very explicit and mm -hmm. get their buy-in. Um, and then they also understand that it's worth their time to listen to you because like how often... Um, have all of us been in a situation where, I mean, we've been on a demo and then we were browsing on another browser tab uh, without even listening or watching anymore because it was just boring. It was just, I mean, the seller going through a list of features that was not particularly interesting. So you just need to create it fine. Otherwise, like it's less time for you and the, and the buyer as well. Right. It's more engaging when they, they can see it in the context of their own business rather than it just being generic kind of semi-relevant features that that they can see uh, maybe maybe it would help me but maybe not yeah i also have once i once had a had someone giving me a demo and i told them i think three or four times in the beginning of the meeting that i first would love to discuss my specific challenges in the business before they give me a presentation of, of, of 
what they can offer because it's 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 otherwise it's very difficult for me to yeah. relate to that and it's also just a waste of my time because I, I probably like wouldn't remember anything after our call anyway and they didn't listen they they still made me like listen to this 20 minute sales pitch <laughs> which is which was the worst and obviously I didn't buy it yeah. it was a um, it was an agency and uh, it was a consulting agency in this case um but I think this is really the worst and I mean two other things that uh um, also, we found work quite well with all our customers and also with ourselves is, um, I mean, one, like focusing on the rule of three. Um, uh, so this is kind of kind of weird, but really is the case. So humans can uh, keep information in their brain better if it's in group of three. It, it, is, it is just a fact. It's just, so this golden rule of three. So focusing on the three most pressing issues that you have in a business or focusing on like, the three most important solutions that you want to pitch in your demo like always helps um, if it's more than very likely that they like forget most of it and um, because it's not the more the better it's actually less the better right so if I really want you to take away one thing from the conversation I'd better just take that one thing and repeat it like 20 times mm -hmm. rather than I don't know telling you 100 different things in any the end hoping that the one thing that is important to you like sticks which is like very unlikely so that's like the, the first thing and the, and the second thing and um, I also really like uh, Andy Raskin and he's a great sales guy. I'm sure you have, not, have heard of him already. And um, he also consulted like a lot of great companies like Zora and Vaughn on the sales pitch. And he also says that you need to make up a story and uh, you need to like put your product or your service in the narrative of I mean, how it can help your customer achieve their goals and how you, how, how you can basically help, help your customer by moving from like a like a bad world or an old world into a new world mm -hmm. and just like create a story around it and then also like have some proof points that uh, also um i mean proof that you can that you did it already with other customers and uh, just like building this whole entire narrative about a demo rather than i mean making it a very like uh, technical discussion that's based on like facts and features and things mm -hmm. that you can deliver um, is something that like works amazingly well i think Interesting. So it's it's all about appealing to somebody as a as a human being, as you said, that buyer is still a person. It's not a company that you're selling to. You have to appeal to that person as a human being um, with narratives and things that are easy to stick in their mind, while of course focusing on how to actually solve a problem that they have. But it's not about just listing out the kind of cool, innovative features that your product has that may or may not work for them. It's like it's got to be really tailored to their experience. You've got to take note of, of in those first couple of minutes when you're kind of building rapport, where, whether they seem to be leaning more towards the analytical, more towards the, the, the supporter type so that you can kind of also change your, um, your communication style. But either way, it's more human than I think many uh, product sellers make it today. Yeah, totally. And that's also just one, one uh, other statistic um, that's also super interesting. So I, I, um, the, where LinkedIn just did a, a state of sales survey um, as a few years ago, um, but they also found out that 71% of customers buy because they like, trust and respect the salesperson they work with. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes total sense. I mean, like, how would you ever buy a software from someone that you wouldn't even trust? Because I mean, it's software, it's code. <laughs> you, 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 you can't understand it. Um, yeah. And if, especially if it's a, a product that you haven't heard about um, yet uh, or haven't heard a lot of times about yet, um, you like, also have to establish the trust um, to, to make uh, your prospect buy in the end or to make your prospect listen to you. Mm -hmm. And it, it, because I mean, like how would they ever know that the product that you want to sell or the software that you want to sell does actually have the desired effect and um, if, if they like, don't really understand I mean, the code behind I mean like the average person does doesn't they can't code and doesn't understand what's behind yeah. the actual product so like uh, especially in the software world like um, a sale is mostly um, based on trust and I mean this is also why I mean branding is also so important and this is also why I mean bigger brands also have like an easier time winning over customers because it's just like more trust established right from the beginning because you might have already heard about that company before you engage with the customer or the, the customer might have already heard about your company and then like there's already a ground level of trust where you i mean when you, whereas when you speak with someone that you haven't met before where, whereas when you speak with someone who like has never heard about your company before at all like just just like more trust that you need to establish in the conversation yeah. and that only works when you i mean see when the person and not as like a, a buyer
That's right. That's right. I've heard it described, especially with outbound where, as you're saying, it's not like they've done the research and they've come into you through your website or something. So especially for an outbound, um, sort of discovery or, or a demo call or whatever, you're starting with negative trust. Like, as you're saying, you've got a baseline of trust. If someone knows of your company and then you still need to build a little bit more as a salesperson, but if they don't know your company, the, the SDR maybe book that meeting cold, you're starting at a, a place of negative trust. So you really need to work to build that. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, uh, especially being an SDR, it's like a, um, a very demanding job. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what do you think about some of the kind of logistical process stuff around um, these types of meetings and moving a deal through the demo? Like, uh, setting an agenda at the beginning of the meeting, setting next steps at the end of, of a meeting, those types of things. What are your kind of best practices that you guys have discovered at Demo Desk there? I mean, for us and also for most of our customers um, uh, that have a, a sex, sex successful and working sales process, like after the demo, um, especially when it's like less of a transactional sale, right? I mean, I'm, I'm speaking about um, ACVs of like 10K and higher. Um, then, I mean, it typically comes down to I mean, establish something like a mutual outcome plan together with the customer. So we call it a mutual outcome plan, it can also be a success plan, but just um, making sure that you understand what the next steps are after the demo. So what needs to happen in order for your customer to maybe run a POC, test out your product or sign the contract, implement the product in the company, what's necessary, what resources are necessary, necessary and just like, walk through that process and basically like fill out that path to like successful and happy customer together with the customer because you, you cannot know um, as a seller um, uh, like what's going on in their company, like who has which decision, right? And just detecting that by using that mutual outcome plan framework helps a lot um, and also helps a lot to mitigate risks. So like obviously there, there might be a lot of companies that have a legal department and that might stand in the way and uh, knowing that uh, as early as possible and it does actually help the cell um, so um, uh, there are a lot of like also with us with our with our software we have to go through a lot of security reviews and like understanding upfront before you actually go into the actual negotiation um, understanding what's necessary whether you need HIPAA compliance or and then you talk to or whatever it is, it's, it's super important. And sometimes sellers, I think, forget it. And then the deal is stuck in like the final stage forever. And I mean, then also establish commitment. I think there are even um, some sellers that go as far and asking for the sale, um, for the sale right away in the call. Um, I mean, we've also tried and some doesn't really work, right? I mean, if, if it's like an extremely big ACV and it's like a, more of like a smaller deal, so maybe, I don't know, like, five to 10 K and so maybe even a little bit below the 10 K uh, threshold. Um, and then you can just, just also ask uh, right in the call, what does it take for you to buy your solution or to buy your product? Like, um, we, can you, can you maybe even buy now or can we find an agreement now? And then um, when they say no, they would probably also then tell you what's the necessary in order to get to the clause. And when they say yes, I mean, even better. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, cool. So establishing with the, with the customer at all the steps that need to happen between now and kind of signing that check and implementing that software. Um, something that stood out to me there that you mentioned was when there is legal or whatever that needs to get involved, don't leave it until like you've got, you've signed and you're handing them the contract and now you've got to go through the whole legal thing. You, you want to try and get the ball rolling there, or at least to have the conversation with the customer so that you know that that's something that has to happen in between now and the contract signing. Um, how, yeah. How do you suggest kind of, if maybe that customer is not hundred percent convinced that they're going to buy, how do you kind of get them on board with, um, laying out that plan with you? I mean, that's still also like part of the mutual outcome plan asking them what they still need to see or want to see so they can make a decision of whether that's a product that they would want to buy and whether that's a product that would help them achieve their goals. And sometimes it's like also a trial or something. Sometimes it's a POC, sometimes it's a case study. I mean, we also sometimes had customers that wanted to do reference calls with other customers. I mean, whatever it is, that's typically something that you can uh, find out in the call. Um, uh, what also very often helps is an ROI calculator. Um, so we, in, in our case, we've also built an ROI calculator that uh, helps you assess the impact that the use of, like in this case, our software would have on on your buyer's team or on your buyer's like, KPIs. And uh, going through that together with them also helps them understand. I mean, 
why it like, costs that much or why there's like a certain price tag attached to it because that's also probably one of the, like, the most common objections. I mean, like I, I'm not so sure if I want to buy this. I'm not so sure if it's worth the money. And then having an ROI calculator at hand that uh, um, actually shows the customer um, why it's worth the money and uh, how much they can actually save, right? Because in the end, I mean, you're always buying software because you want to make your people more efficient. Um, so you want to just make more of, out of the resources that you have. Um, or you want to save time, and um, so that's actually like uh, the two most important things when it comes to when it comes to buying software and like having that inner calculation that you can go through with the customer is very often very helpful. Hmm. Well, that's a great kind of segue to to what I would love to be my last question about demo desk. So similarly, demo desk uh, was designed to help salespeople be more efficient. You're helping automate those non-selling tasks and just help the the sales reps only kind of replicate the top performing behavior. What what is some of the most surprising learnings that you have um, kind of uncovered as working with your sales team and and with your customers um, using demo desk? Probably the most surprising learning for us is that there are a lot of very established companies that don't have their sales process laid out in detail yet. Um, so they, there are a lot of situations, um, or there were a lot of situations in the past where we spoke to, um, I mean, established sales teams, big sales teams, and uh, we were asking them to, I mean, explain explain to us like how the sales process actually works and like what's essential for each of these stages um, in along the sales process. And not everyone has like a perfect answer to this yet, right? Whereas you might think, I mean, typically everyone should have that. And so our role is very often, I mean, together with the customer, putting it together and like helping them establish like a sales process that, that's actually repeatable and scalable. Mm -hmm. Because in a lot of cases, I mean, even though the sales team might be quite big already. There's not like a codified, scalable, very clear sales process established. And especially when it comes down to material, to sales material being used. I mean, very often the um, sales are still just using outdated old material that's stored on like the local computers, like a PDF or PowerPoint presentation. That's just still very often the case, which is quite shocking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so yeah, but that's, I think, even more motivating to work in that space and improve things for the better. Yeah, absolutely. That's so interesting. And I think that's, yeah, a perfect bookend for us. There are tons of companies out there that don't have a really great sales process. So if you can implement a really strong one, kind of following all of those steps that we laid out for you there, sales reps, if you can implement a strong uh, process for yourself to follow and repeat and scale. The likelihood is that you'll be able to stand out from the competition uh, when it comes to trying to sell to these buyers, because a lot of sales reps just aren't equipped with these, with these processes. So follow those steps that we outlined here with Veronica and and you'll absolutely have a better shot at closing those deals. Um, Veronica, if people want to learn more from you, if they want to learn more about Demo Desk, where can they get in touch with you? Wherever they want. LinkedIn, directly via demos.com, whatever is easiest. Okay, perfect. Well, we'll include those links for everybody. Um, thank you so much, Veronica, for, for joining me on the show. It was such an interesting conversation. Thank you. That's and great. Thank, thank you so thank much, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all of you guys for watching another episode of the Predictable Revenue Podcast. We'll catch you next time.